we are live. So good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Um, and today, instead of introducing another speaker, I'm going to be talking a little bit about an expedition I got to do last summer. Uh, but first, I wanted to turn it over to our classrooms, give them a chance to say a big hello. So first, we've got Miss Furnival's grade fours in Guelph, Ontario, Canada. Hi, guys. Hi, welcome in. We've got Miss Lackey's grade fours in Freehold in New Jersey. Hi, guys. Hi. Again, is it really a session if we don't have someone from Freehold in? I don't really know. Um, we've got uh, Coral Reef Elementary joining us for the very first time in Miami, Florida with a bunch of classes. Hi to you guys. Oh, there's so many of you. We got, we got all of Miami in today. And then last but not least, and I love when we get Texas classrooms, we've got Miss Elliott's grade sixes in Dallas, Texas. Hi, guys. Hello. Hey, welcome in. All right. So uh, the reason you guys are all here today, much to my surprise, is, is for me. So I'm going to turn it over to screen share, uh, and then we are going to dive in with a little bit on Madagascar. So let me share that and get us underway. All right. And if we should be good, it should all be up, but if it's not for any reason, just let me know and I'll, I'll get it up a little better. Anyway, so uh, my name's Jesse. I'm an ecologist by background, which means that I try and understand about animals and how to interact and engage with one another. Uh, but my main gig is as a science communicator. So I work uh, through Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants largely to help share the stories of scientists and, and expedition leaders and explorers all around the world with, with kids like you guys. So this was a special thing for me in a variety of ways. I have been very lucky to have had the chance to travel a lot in my life, uh, but never on an actual expedition and never to anywhere quite as foreign from my hometown of Toronto, Canada as Madagascar. And so let's dive in. Why Madagascar? So Madagascar is totally and utterly unique. It's about 600 miles, a thousand kilometers off the coast of mainland Africa. And it has been an island sort of independent by itself, not touching any other landmass for longer than almost any place in the world. And what that means is that the creatures there have gone through like a, it's like an evolutionary playground. The creatures have adapted and changed into the most amazing and unique forms in the world. And because there hasn't been crossing over with, with creatures from mainland Africa, they're really unique. A lot of the things that live in Madagascar live nowhere else on earth. And so I just picked four stories at random uh, to highlight this. The top left, you'll see my favorite bug in the world, which is called a giraffe necked weevil. It's a really fantastic insect. I mean, look at that ridiculous neck. Uh, I had the chance to go to a place where it lives in Madagascar when I was there. Uh, and unfortunately, I was just out of season. It has to be the rainy season and I was there the dry season. So, oh, well, I'll have to go back. The top right's interesting. Uh, it's called a fusa. So when I had explained to my family and friends that I was going to be going on a, a multi-week bush hiking expedition, a lot of them were worried that being Africa, uh, I could be eaten by something like a leopard or lion or, or trampled by something like an elephant. Well, in Madagascar, there aren't any of those things. And the biggest predator on the island is the fusa, which is sort of like a turbo weasel. It's about the size of a, a small mid-sized dog and it hunts lemurs in the forest. It's really unique. It's the, the main nemesis of the lemur and the agility and athletic feats it can perform in the trees is quite unbelievable. Like it's, a, it's an amazing thing to see. The bottom left, we have a tenrec. So you guys might know porcupines or hedgehogs or maybe even echidnas you've heard about in Australia, but very few people have heard about tenrecs. They're the fourth kind of spiny mammal and there's a whole bunch of them in Madagascar. They're really hard to find. I like them because the mothers have huge litters, babies like 20, 30 babies. And when they gather food together, little insects and stuff, the babies are kind of nervous. So one will bite the mom's tail and then the second baby will bite its tail and so on and so forth. So what it looks like is this furry spiny snake that's going through the bush. It's very unique and, and very cool. And then on the bottom right, chameleons. So chameleons do exist in mainland Africa, but they really hit their stride in Madagascar. There's more of them there than anywhere else in the world. And they range from the pygmy chameleon, which is pictured, which can wrap neatly around your finger, to two foot long mellers and panther chameleons, which are just amazing and big and, and kind of scary, actually. Chameleons are so cool. They've got the eyes that swivel you know, different directions, as, as most people know, the tongue that can dart out and grab things. One of the biggest myths about chameleons is that they change their color really to blend in with uh, the, 
blend in with the environment. Whereas most chameleons are actually blending in to show their emotion. If they found a female and they want to let her know they're there and say hi, or, or they're scared of another male, um, they're really unique and, and really fantastic. But what most people think of when they think of Madagascar is lemurs. So there are over a hundred species of lemur in Madagascar, ranging from the mouse lemur, which can fit in your pocket neatly, like in your shirt or in your hand, uh, or Indries, which are the biggest ones. Uh, they're about 20 pounds or so, and they're amazing. They got one of the loudest calls in the world. Uh, I got a chance to hear an injury, and it's sort of like being woken up like this. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And it goes on for 20 minutes, and it's the most amazing sound. Uh, pictured here, we've got ring-tailed lemurs. They're in the south of the country. They're really unique and, and have uh, societies where the females rule the roost and, and rule the whole society. And then on the right, you've got the Krat Brothers from Wild Krats with Zabumafu, which is a Kokoril Shafaka. I got the chance to see many of those. Uh, from the first slide, you'll see a, a picture of one that I took uh, in the National Park. And they are the most athletic lemur. They can jump 30, 40 feet between trees with these amazing hands that can clip onto spines and, and not be affected at all. But amidst all this amazing wildlife, uh, Madagascar is one of the most degraded countries in the world. It, uh, you can see in the picture on the right, its forest cover has gone down radically in the last hundred years. And the last picture there is from 1990. So it's gone down even more since then. Really the biggest tracts of forest left are places that are surrounded and protected by national parks, uh, which is a shame because the forests, as you can see in the top left, are so unique. Those are baobab trees, and they are one of the most uh, incredible uh, organisms on the planet. They look like a tree that's sort of tipped upside down with its roots in the air, and they store tons of water in those huge, thick trunks. Uh, but between people hunting for bushmeat in the forest, burning forests down for charcoal, burning forests down for farmland, uh, a lot of this biodiversity is under threat. And so this was the background uh, that we went into the expedition with. So how to get there? So I don't think you can see my mouse uh, in this kind of screen share on a Mac, uh, but I started in Toronto, so in the Great Lakes in the middle of Canada, and it's an eight hour flight from there across the Atlantic Ocean to get to Paris. Once you're in Paris, um, it is uh, another 11 hour flight over the Alps in Italy, over the Mediterranean Sea, over all these amazing places to get to Madagascar, and you get to Antananarivo. So this is the capital, everyone just calls it Tana, uh, and it is totally uh, fantastic. It has about 2.6 million people, which makes it comparable in size to somewhere like Toronto or Chicago in the States. Um, but the buildings are all really short. The, the biggest buildings are usually about four or three stories high. Um, and it's set amidst this huge sprawl amidst these big hills. It smells like burning rice husk, which there are a lot of in the, in the town and diesel fuel. So if you've gone to a mechanic shop ever, a lot of Tana smells like that. because They've got a lot of really old cars. You can see one in the bottom right with the door panel ripped off, which is pretty normal for a car in Tana. Um, really old cars and really dirty fuel. So it's a unique place, but you walk down the street from where we were staying, you can get Coca-Cola, Ferrara Rochers, and spaghetti carbonara. So it's a, a, a unique and, and really interesting place. Again, about as different from Toronto as I've ever seen in my life. So from Tana to get to our park, it's a nine hour drive. Uh, and if Mario Kart were how people actually drove, that is how the driving is in Madagascar. There's roads with no angles on them. There's people and animals walking in the roads. There's no right of way. There's no traffic lights. It's kind of crazy and chaotic, um, but really beautiful on the way. And so where we were going, if you look at the left picture, uh, Madagascar is about the size of Alberta and we start out about in the middle on the right and it took nine hours to get to the red rectangle near the top left and so that is called Ankara Fence National Park uh, and it's a dry forest it's really beautiful it sort of reminds me of Ontario in the fall when the leaves are starting to fall and it's, it's dry and there's no rain or anything like that um, and lovely and we're on a big lake so we're right near a huge lake filled with Nile crocodiles and thousands of birds and one morning we woke up and it was, it sounded like this. It was like, there's a bird called the crying baby bird. And there were about a hundred of them that had flown and landed right outside our, our place. So it was a really, uh, a jarring way to, to get up in the morning. So from here, we, we packed our bags, we got ready, we prepped for the expedition and we set out. So the journey was to traverse this national park and Karafansk, the perimeter, the outside of it is about 200 kilometers, about 140 miles. And our goal was to walk around this entire park uh, for two reasons. 
One, we were there to talk to village elders and chiefs uh, to ask about the loss of forest in the community. How did these people perceive the change in the habitats around them, the change in the amounts of lemurs and other animals? Uh, and second was to do lemur surveys. So our first, uh, which I'll get to in just a second. So our first day we walked 16 kilometers, about 10 miles. It was 34 degrees Celsius, so like 92 or something uh, Fahrenheit, so really hot, no shade. And we get to the village and this village, this beautiful village in the bottom right, uh, it was a place where many of the people had never seen foreigners before. And so for every single thing we did, we had 50 to 100 people standing around us in a circle watching us. So when we're setting up our tent or when we're eating, it's sort of like being an animal in a zoo, being, you know, something that's so curious that people need to look at and watch because everything we were doing was so foreign to everything that they'd ever done. So that was really unique and, and fantastic. And then we went out on a lemur survey. So we got there in the afternoon and at night we set out. And so we walk another five kilometers, three miles through the bush and you're passing rice paddies, uh, people's farms, you're passing through fields of grass that are seven feet tall where it's taller than your head and you can't see people 10 feet away under this canopy of thousands and thousands of stars, the most stars you've ever seen in your life. And you get to this dense little forest. And when you're doing a survey, when you're looking for lemurs scientifically, you walk really slow. Imagine if you were trying to cross your classroom in about 10 minutes, that's how slowly you're walking and you're shining this really powerful flashlight around and you're looking for eye shine. So, you know, when you drive at night and your, your headlights sometimes hit a dog, see a dog or a cat and you see their eyes shining back at you, that's what we're looking for for lemurs. And the researchers I was with knew what kinds of lemurs those were from the eye shine. And so we're looking for these and we're hacking with a machete through dense bush and there are boas going along the ground and there are spiders bigger than my hand on webs that are about 10 to 15 feet across between trees. So I'm, I would like turn and there'd be a spider like six inches from my face and I'd have to duck under his web and, and hide. So it was a really <laughs> kind of sketchy actually. Um, we saw scorpions and more eaten alive by mosquitoes. It was quite uh, the experience. And so we came back to camp and, and that was just day one. So we walked for 10 total days in this expedition and 14 of which were actually out there. Four days we rested, which was very necessary. Um, and the landscapes were fantastic. We had dense jungle canopy where we crossed rivers, uh, either through the river directly and took our shoes off and, and pulled our pants you know, up to our knee, uh, walked over bridges. We passed grasslands that had been burned out so you could see thousands of these termite mines in the, like, in the top right. And the termite mines are, are amazing. They go on for miles and each one of them has tens of thousands of little termites. I'd never seen termites, so this was really exciting for me. The bottom left, and this is something we've seen in, in some other Madagascar sessions we've done, are lavaca. So in parts of Madagascar, the land just erodes and falls away. So imagine you're walking through a grassland and it's all smooth and flat. And then all of a sudden, you see this from about 20 feet away for the first time. There's just a pit that's 60 feet deep. Um, and so these are kind of, they're not dangerous, but you want to look out for them because you don't really want to fall in. It would be a very bad, bad way to end. Um, and then grasslands. So this is a dry forest, as I mentioned. And so on the outskirts of the forest, you've got these grasslands. To me, it, it reminded me of Saskatchewan. Uh, for U.S. classrooms, it'd be Idaho, Iowa. Uh, endless fields of grass. So one day we walked for 32 kilometers, or about 20 miles, uh, through grass just like this in the bottom right. So it could be six inches high, it could be six feet high, it, it varied. I have no idea how the guides who were taking us between the villages knew how to go, knew which way to go. They had no GPSs, they were just going based on the way that they always knew to go. There was no trail, there was nothing. Um, it, was, it was quite amazing. People are what made the expedition though. So uh, the main team uh, is in the top left. So there's me looking increasingly sketchy with a, a weird, terrifying beard. Um, beside me are Megan Alward and Travis Steffen. So they are lemur researchers and they were the scientific leads in the expedition. They did all the lemur surveys and they collected all the data and, and figured all that out. And they've spent decades in the field doing work like this. And then on the right, we have Hassana and Jean-Paul. So Hassana and Jean-Paul work for Travis's nonprofit organization. And I'll cover that a little later. Uh, but Hassana was the translator. So he worked with me to do these interviews with local chiefs and elders. Uh, and Jean-Paul is just a, a really, a, the sort of person that everybody likes and can smooth everything over. Imagine for the villagers, imagine for your house, that all of a sudden one day, nine strangers show up, as it was us, 
and gendarmes with uh, the AK-47s in the top right. So we had guys with guns joining us the whole time and guides from the last village. So nine people come to your house and say, look, we need to camp out in your living room. We need to set up tents. We'd like some water. Uh, oh, and could you help us go and explore the forest nearby in the middle of the night, which you never do. And everywhere we went, people were so welcoming. People always invited us in. Sometimes they made food for us. They always made us feel welcome. They shared stories with us. And Jean Paul was the reason that, that all happened. So it was amazing having these people that, uh, that could make that sort of experience possible and make this a successful expedition. And again, I mentioned that the villages were so excited to see us. It was so weird and foreign to them. So on the bottom, you've got pictures of villages coming to gather around and, and say hi and check us out uh, in villages and on our way between villages. Um, the people in Madagascar, again, were the most uh, welcoming, wonderful people I've ever run across in all my travels in the world. It was a real privilege to get the chance to, to meet them and, and to see them and to learn a little bit about their, their way of life in their country. So as for goals, I said uh, we had two missions on this expedition, and that is, again, to talk to village elders about the loss of forest and to understand what's happening in, in the region, uh, and to do lemur surveys, understand where the lemurs are, what kind of lemurs there are around the park, are they where we didn't expect them, are they where we expected them, are there a lot of them, are there a few? And so the reason we were doing this, the reason that we got to go in the first place, is because of one our expedition leads nonprofit. So Travis runs a program called Planet Madagascar, which is an amazing organization. He's been working for decades in promoting conservation uh, and you know environmental understanding in Madagascar locally among the people. So as part of that work, they in the top right you'll see they plant seedlings, so thousands and thousands of little trees, and they grow them to the point where they can take them and plant them in a forest and grow a new forest, new habitat for creatures to live in. They also create fire breaks. So fire is a big problem in Madagascar. And so a fire break is like that grassland I showed you earlier. But if you burn a huge long trail about 15 feet wide for miles through it, and that means that if a fire catches in one part of the grassland, it doesn't cross over and catch the other part on fire. So you save habitat by creating these breaks for the fire. And then they have a women's cooperative. So they work with the local community there, again, to plant seedlings, to promote environmental understanding, to get people doing patrols, to guard the woodland against poachers, against people coming in to exploit the forest. It's a really remarkable organization doing really fantastic work. Uh, the most amazing village we got a chance to see was the one that had worked for the longest with Planet Madagascar. So it was really exciting uh, as sort of an outsider to come in and see this work being done. And this is something that a lot of really fantastic groups are, are doing around the world. So it was exciting to, to get a chance to check that out. And then some awesome photos. It was a beautiful place. Like Madagascar is, is totally unique, as I've said, um, and lovely. The top left is one of the most beautiful sunsets I've ever seen. The top right is a shafaka, so Zabumafu, a, a cockerel shafaka. So we saw, I saw a few of these on our journey because I didn't go on the big lemur surveys all that often. But this is in the National Park parking lot. So literally 10 feet away from this lemur is a SUV. Uh, it's 100 feet from the main park office. And I came out one day and a family of seven of them, some of which with babies, were all jumping around. One got within six feet of me and looked me right in the eye. And they're just the most beautiful lemur. It's just an amazing creature. The bottom left was a snake. So I love snakes. I know a lot of people don't like snakes. Um, this one wasn't venomous. He was just going along. He's about four or five feet long. So we saw a few snakes throughout our expedition and they're really, they're quite lovely. Um, and the bottom right is the view out of tent. So every day we we walk these 20 kilometers or so, we set up our camp. Um, and I got a chance to set up my camp one day where when I opened the tent flap, that is the view of the, the forest around and the river we had to cross. And it's a beautiful place to set up camp and, and to do science and to explore and just understand the, the area. So last but not least, a huge thank. So this is something that I want to stress just both for my expedition and for expeditions in general. I already mentioned Hassan and John Paul being integral uh, to the expedition and they're in the top. Uh, on the bottom, we have Mommy. So Mommy is the, the lead of Planet Madagascar in Madagascar itself, and he made everything possible. When we finished our expedition, he was there with snacks and a truck to pick us up. He organized the whole thing. Uh, everywhere people go, researchers, explorers, what have you, anywhere in the world that may be, and earlier we had a session from China, and later we have a session from the Northern Arctic, people need the help of locals who understand the region, who live there, who live and breathe these places. Uh, and so, again, I, I stress the Malagasy people in Madagascar were the nicest people I've ever had a chance to work with, uh, some of which will be lasting long, uh, you know, lifelong friends. Uh, and without Hassan, Jean-Paul, and Mommy, this expedition simply doesn't happen. 
Without the support, we are not able to do this research. We're not able to have these interactions with people. And this work ultimately feeds back into the park. The goal of these uh, studies and, and surveys are to share that with park staff, with park uh, conservation officers, with communities, so that we can further uh, you know, ensure that people are engaged and excited about conservation for years to come, that they want to protect these habitats uh, and keep them going. So uh, a huge thanks to all the Madagascar uh, people that live there and, and, and made this a fantastic time. And so, yes, with that said, uh, let's dive in with questions. Thank you guys so, so much for uh, humoring me and, and being willing to listen about all this. And I look so very forward to diving in with questions. We've also got a few groups watching on YouTube live as well. Uh, and so if you guys want to type in questions, let me know where you're joining from, uh, what grade you're in. I'd love to take some questions from you as well. But let us start off and uh, go to Miss Furtival's class. If you guys want to kick us off, come on up. How many kinds of, um, about how many kinds of animals are there? How many kinds of animals in Madagascar? Oh, thousands upon thousands. As I said, there's over a hundred kinds of lemur. There's hundreds of chameleons. There are tons of snakes, birds especially. So this is something I didn't share any pictures of, but the birds in Madagascar, I'll show some pictures uh, later to all our classes tuning in, are some of the most beautiful in the world. So uh, I don't know offhand how many species, but thousands of really unique and amazing creatures uh, are, are there in Madagascar. Great question. All right, how about Miss Lackey's class? If you guys want to come oh, up and ask. Um, in that picture of the snake that you took, what type yeah. of snake was it? I don't know. I haven't looked into that, actually. You'd think I would have found that out. <laughs> but I, I will try and find out for you as soon as I can, which is odd for me because I'm the sort of person who, when I see a snake, like anywhere in the world, I dart into the bush to grab the snake. So I did sort of stroke that snake's tail and let him go on his way because I didn't know what kind of snake he was at the time and I didn't want him to be aggressive uh, or to bother him just in his day. Um, but I will find that out for you. That's very, that's a good question. Sorry for that. Uh, all right, how about we go to Coral Reef Elementary School? Come on up guys with, with all your 57 classes you have. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Tanner. What can we do to help Matt and Asgar? Yeah, so a lot of things actually. One, the, the great question, Tanner. Uh, so the best is keep educated. And I say this for all our sessions. The more you know about these places, the more you're going to be inclined to protect them. Some places around the world seem so foreign as to be like Mars. Most people will never get a chance to go to Madagascar. Or again, we had a, a China session earlier in the remote Chinese pl Tibetan plateau. People don't get a chance to see those places. So the best way to understand them is research, learn, watch videos take part. As for actual conservation, there are a bunch of organizations. So, I mean, I'm not directly affiliated with Planet Madagascar, but Planet Madagascar is an amazing example of a charity where money goes a long way in helping conservation. Madagascar, the average salary, like what a person will make in an entire year, if they're doing pretty well, is about $1,000 Canadian, which is about, I don't know what the exchange rate is, but it's like $250 uh, American. No, it's like $750 American in a whole year. And so, in some places where you donate money to causes, um, that contributes to a small thing. But $1,000 in Madagascar can pay for a person to do patrols around the park all year long. So they can help protect it from poachers. They can help protect it from burning down. They can create fire breaks. All that can be done with $1,000. And that's pretty unique in the world uh, that that money can go that far. Um, and additionally, you know, again, learn, contribute to zoos, organizations that uh, share lemurs. Toronto, we have a beautiful zoo that has a bevy of lemurs. So understanding those sort of animals uh, goes a long way. But whether it's contributing to saving wildlife in Madagascar directly, promoting women's cooperatives, which is a big thing in conservation now. People have started to realize that if you uh, promote and support women and, and communities of women uh, around the world, it does more than absolutely anything because those people are, are then inclined to be stewards and champions of their community. So that's something you can do for Madagascar and it's something you can do for, for pretty much anywhere. Great question. All right, uh, Miss Elliott's class, if you guys have a question, come on up. Um, what kind of gear did you have to pack and what was the most valuable thing that you packed? Yeah, so I didn't even mention gear and that's funny, I'll have to do that in my next presentation. Our packs were huge. So the pack on our back, uh, tip on a you know average day, and it got lighter as it went on, thankfully, was about 45 to 50 pounds. So 20 or so kilograms that we had to carry every single day in this heat. 
So it was a slog. In fact, I had quite a bit of trouble with it. I had heat exhaustion one day and had to give up my pack to a, a porter or someone to help me carry it because it was simply too much to handle. So that pack had everything. It had all our food for two weeks. So we couldn't, the, the Malagasy people that were with us on our expedition, they could eat in the villages. They could eat the rice, they could eat the food that was prepared. We really couldn't for fear of, of getting some sort of foodborne illness. So we brought all our food with us, every dinner, every breakfast, every lunch, all our snacks, which made up a, a huge portion of, of the pack. Um, and we cooked it on this little stove on a little tiny, um, like a big Bunsen burner. If you've ever seen a Bunsen burner, that's basically what we cooked our water on, poured that into our pre-made food packs and, and ate those every day. They were surprisingly good. The most important part of our pack, in addition to the, the food and the, the tents and the, all our clothes and gear and hats and sunscreen were very important, was our water purification. So in Canada and the States, we are absurdly lucky. And this is something that has held true everywhere I've traveled. We can go to a tap, pour a glass of water, and drink the water with no harm whatsoever. That is not true of most of the world. Uh, and so in the capital, in Tana, and certainly in the bush, the water that we drank, it's kind of a gross out thing, but so sometimes it was like a stream and we get our water from the stream and we put these purification tablets in to kill any bacteria and viruses. And it would, it would look weird, it would be silty. Like imagine drinking dirty water, but it would be okay. There's nothing much in it. But sometimes the only water to be had was like a big puddle. And on the edge of the puddle are where cows have gone to the bathroom. So there's big piles of poo on the edge of this puddle. But that's the only water you can get. There's no bottled water, there's no tap, there's no anything. So we found the cleanest looking part of that and we get it and we put purification tablets in to kill anything. So none of us got sick, which is a testament to how good the purification tablets were. Um, but that was by far the most important part of our pack and, and kind of a, again, a gross out thing, but really neat. So I noticed too, we had a fifth class join us uh, while we were started. And we also have a bunch of groups watching on YouTube. So if you're watching on YouTube and you want to type in questions, please do. And I'll take as many as I can. Uh, but Mrs. Karagiannis' this class in Toronto, if you guys have a question, uh, come on up. Let's see if we can get your mic. So our question is, yeah. have you traveled anywhere other than Madagascar? Yeah, not, no. on, not on an expedition. So nothing quite like Madagascar. Um, I, I, again, I've been very lucky. I, I've seen Tanzania, Ecuador, Peru, Jordan most recently. So a lot of really unique and, and beautiful places. But those were... were solo trips uh, where there was some roughing it involved, but nothing quite like Madagascar, nothing quite like an actual expedition. And the, the difference between the two really drove that point home that when people travel to these places, it's really fantastic and it's a beautiful experience and, and wonderful, uh, but nothing like what researchers actually do going out in the field. And I wanna to stress too, even this expedition for me, so we were out there for two weeks. Uh, Megan and Travis have at times spent up to a year straight in the bush living in a tent. So there are people that do this for their entire life. And this is something that's really uh, uh, exceptional to me. And, and we get to share these stories through exploring by the seat of your pants with people who do this in a lot more professional capacity than I do. So great question. All right, uh, let's head back to Ms. Furnival's class. Come on up guys. Um, have you, did you get bit by any animals there? I got bit by a lot of bugs, like so, so many mosquitoes. It was ridiculous. Although, uh, so that was it in terms of biting, nothing else bit me. I tried really hard not to get bit. It's probably why I didn't pick up that snake, uh, just in case. But the most interesting bug to me in Madagascar were sweat bees. So I'd never heard of these before I went. Sweat bees are these little tiny bees. Uh, so they fit, a few of them could fit on your fingernail. And they don't come to sting and they don't make honey. They come to drink your sweat. So at times there'd be like a hundred bees on my arm, just sucking up all my sweat. So it wasn't being bit, but it was really unique and, and kind of gross, but really fun. <laughs> awesome question. All right, let's go back to Miss Lackey's class. Um, what were, what were the villagers reactions when you were talking to them about what was happening? the forest yeah i'm so glad we got that question and i'm sorry i didn't cover it actually in the presentation so this was such a uh, amazing experience to talk to people who were 50 60 70 years old in some cases and who you know we can look at satellite maps and we can look at uh pictures showing that the forest has been lost 
But that's a totally different experience than hearing from people about that forest being lost. And so in every village that we, we interviewed people, they mentioned, like that was the first thing out of their mouths is, man, there used to be so much more forest and now it's so much less. And they talked about the changes that that's had on their life. So they talked about the fact that it used to be a lot easier to get water. Forests create their own water. They channel water in ways that allow it to be usable. They really are the, the watersheds. They, they make that possible, make living in those places possible. And with the loss of forest, farmers aren't seeing that as much. They get less water for their crops. They get less water for their people. And so in many cases, there's had to be big changes to, you know, creating ditches, creating channels to move water in from elsewhere because the water that used to be there locally is gone. They also mentioned uh, the loss of wildlife. So the most, the, the one that touched me the most and is also really sad um, is in one village, they said that, you know, it used to be by five years old, kids would know tons of different kinds of lemurs. They, they could know them by, by hearing them, uh, like just their calls at any time of day and they know where they were and how big the bands were. And now by age 10, um, people don't necessarily know that many lemurs at all. They have to travel away from where they are, even if that's, you know, 10, 15 kilometers, even if it's not that far, it's still sad that they used to have this diversity of animals around them and now they don't because of the loss of forest. Um, and to a person, they all wanted there to be more forest. This is something where, you know, it's either been necessity that's caused them to impact the forest around them, or in many cases, people have come up from other places in Madagascar to exploit the forest. People that have destroyed their own forest have come up to exploit this other forest. So it, it's a tricky situation. People feel less secure too, which was interesting to me. Um, so people feel like they're, they're in more danger from, from bandits and other things. And this was a concern. This is why we had guys with guns with us the whole time is that there are bandits in the park that take people's water, take their cows, sometimes take their life. Um, and so that was a, a security measure that we had to have and villages felt more insecure because of the loss of these habitats around them. So it was really, um, it was quite eye opening. And I think that the, the testimony of, of these people uh, can be again fed back to park officials, to governments in Madagascar and really make a lasting difference. So if, if that comes out of it, uh, it will have been a real uh, thrill to get a chance to do that. And in general, it was just such an exciting, uh, unique opportunity to get to, to talk to a village chief on a raffia mat in his, his community where the kids had never seen someone who's from Canada or the States or, or anywhere else. So yeah, I, I hope that answers it. Uh, Let's uh, head to a third class of Coral Reef Elementary if you guys want to come up. In fact, I'm going to take two from Coral Reef Elementary because I know you have a whole bunch of classes there. So we'll start with one and I'll come back for a second in just a minute. Hello, my name Hi. is Theo. Why are the Madagascar birds uh, important to the food chain? Yeah, to the food chain? That's a good question. You know, I'd be talking out of my hat if I were to explain that in a serious way, uh, but birds certainly keep insect populations in check. And this is something that's true all around the world. When you lose birds, insects take off. Things like spiders, things like mosquitoes. So it's really good to keep uh, bird populations healthy for that reason. Um, outside of that, I don't know specifically why in Madagascar bird populations would be uh, uh, important, but around the world, uh, birds are a hugely important facet of any ecosystem. And we've lost about a third of the birds in the world in the last few decades. So birds are, are a group that's really under threat. They don't seem that way because we go outside and we hear birds and we see birds regularly, but uh, it's something really worth uh, taking care of and, and making sure that we don't have a huge slide in birds because they are so very important. Great question. And then, yeah, I'll come right back to Coral Reef. You guys have another one. What is Oops, small? Hi, my name is Brandon. Hi. What is the smallest type of lemur that you have? Yeah, so the smallest type of lemur, and I actually got a chance to see these. Again, in our park, we were looking for about four or five different species of lemur. Um, but the one that I got to see on my lemur survey was the mouse lemur. So the mouse lemur, if you hold your hand out right now, could fit in your hand, just like sitting in your hand quite easily. If you had a big pocket in your shirt, you could plop a mouse lemur in the pocket and it could sort of like look out from that. So they're really cool, uh, they're really beautiful, and they're everywhere. Mouse lemurs actually, uh, unlike a lot of lemurs in Madagascar, aren't endangered, they're least concerned, which means that we are keeping track of their status, uh, but they're, they're no imminent threat, but they're very, very cool. I, I really like seeing them. All right, uh, how about Miss Elliot's class? And then we'll take a couple more after that and we'll, we'll wrap up there. Um, what species, species is the largest and number of which is the most threatened by deforestation? 
Yeah. So the yeah. most lemurs, uh, as I said, the, the most common, the most lemurs are everywhere. They're all across the island. The most threatened is really interesting. It's really hard to track that sort of thing because populations differ and it's hard to find some of these lemurs. The one that's probably, I would say in the most trouble, or the it, it's so hard to find it that it's hard to get a sense of its numbers, is the I-I. So A-Y-E, A-Y-E. Most of you will have never seen an I-I or a picture of an I-I. They are the most unique and freaky. I, I've said everything's unique, and it is. Nothing is as unique as the I-I. I'm going to send a picture of the I-I at the end of this presentation to all the classes. But the I-I is the freakiest, weirdest creature in the world. I'd like to think that most creatures are beautiful in some way. I'm not sure I can make that case for the eye eye. It's this weird bug eyed sort of monster that lives in the trees um, and has one really long finger. It uses like tap along trees and then spear grubs and just suck them off. So they're really weird. Um, they're fantastic. And, and I, you know, I hope they're conserved and, and live for many, many years. In fact, uh, Megan, uh, who was on the expedition, her main thing is an eye eye researcher. And she had spent two years in the bush looking for them and saw two. So they are really hard to find. Um, so I'd say aye, aye, but a lot of lemurs are really under threat. There are some that we've just discovered recently. So we actually found a new kind of lemur in the last 10 years that we never knew existed. So they're critically endangered. And once you get to critically endangered, it's the only step before extinction. So the only step left before they're gone altogether. And a, a lot of lemurs are endangered or critically endangered. Uh, lemurs are, are probably the, the group of animals in the world that is most at risk of entirely being wiped out. Um, within our lifetimes, which is tragic. Um, but as I said with Madagascar, uh, things are changing. Money goes a long way in promoting conservation. Uh, Madagascar is developing a tourism industry where people are coming specifically to see the lemurs. Uh, and so it's, I, I see the change happening. I'm very optimistic, um, but it's not a good situation as it stands right now. So, all right, you know what? I'm gonna take one more question. I know they have a huge group in, so I'll go to Ms. Furnival's class to wrap up and then uh, we'll, be, we'll be done. But actually, you know what? We have time. I don't, there's no session that I have to ask questions because there's no other speaker today. So we'll do a whole other four rounds if you guys are good. So Ms. Furnival's class, come on up first and we'll, we'll go from there. <laughs> um, what are other um, reasons that um, lemurs are endangered? Yeah, so I mean, the, there are a few main ones. Uh, the most is loss of habitat. Just like uh, pretty much every animal in the world, humans are destroying their habitat. If you don't have a place to live, you won't survive. So that's the biggest one is that the forest that they rely on is being burned down for farmland, it's being burned down for charcoal. So that's a real problem. And the second is, is bushmeat hunting um, and the use of pets. So bushmeat is, is people killing lemurs for their food. Uh, in the last two decades, there was a a civil, not a war necessarily, but a, a strife in Madagascar where people were upset with each other. And people came into the national park and hunted a lot of the lemurs that used to be right there. So that's a real problem. And second is, is animals. So cats and dogs, we have them as pets. They're part of the family. That's lovely. And in places in Madagascar villages, we ran into villages that had dogs, which is very nice for the people. It's nice to have a dog, but those dogs and cats eat the lemurs and they eat the wildlife. And they're not doing that to be mean, they're just doing it because of their natural predatory instincts. But cats especially, uh, around the world actually, are one of the biggest causes of death for you know, species that are endangered around the world. So this is just a, a call basically like Price is Right to spay and neuter pets uh, so that they don't get out into the wild, they don't uh, take out uh, local wildlife. Uh, and it is a big problem, but it's something that again, can be remedied. All right, Miss Lackey's class with the student who's waiting. Come on up. You used um water tablets to clean your water like yeah. how did the villagers clean their water they don't have to so in some cases you know, it's it's uh interesting when i um I drink my tap water i'm totally fine but if i were to go to a place uh like mexico city say where they have tap water where maybe the locals drink the tap water i wouldn't necessarily be able to drink that that's just a, an example out of the blue but people get used to the bacteria and the creatures in their own water and food it's part of the reason sometimes when you try really foreign foods, they can really affect you, not just spices. It's like what's in the food and, and the, you know, the, the creatures that might live in the food, little bacteria and things like that. So uh, in most cases, Malagasy people just took water out of, you know, the same things that we took them out of and drank it. Uh, in some cases, they had cleaner wells. So in, in some of the more built up villages, there'd be a well in the corner, uh, you know, a bucket that you lowered down 20 feet into the well and pulled up the water. So that was really nice. 
those villages also had sh like bucket showers, which were really nice too after after ten days of walking. Uh, but yeah, in most cases, they just drank the water, um, which we simply couldn't do. We, we probably would have gotten very very ill. And there are thousands and thousands of stories of researchers uh, going to places and getting ill drinking the water. But yeah, good question. All right, um, how about we go back to coral reef? More fans. If there's any more, and if there's not, that's okay. Oh, got one. Yes, hi. Hi, hi my name is Evelyn, and I wanted to know. Here's Evelyn's what question. What is the current lemur population of Madagascar, and how can we? What can we do to improve it from Miami? Yeah, excellent, and I love that you specified from Miami. So I will be frank. I have absolutely not the foggiest clue what the total lemur population of Madagascar is. You'd be as good at guessing that as I would. It's very hard to get those sort of numbers and I'd have to assess all the research over the last many years. From Miami, and this speaks back to something we talked about earlier, learn as much as you can. Lemurs are fantastic. Between Wild Crats, which is a fantastic series, BBC, so the British Broadcasting Corporation has a whole series on Madagascar that features a lot on lemurs. You can learn so much about them and learn more than I could ever teach you as an individual about what you can do to take part. But outside of that, and this is something that Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants is, is really committed to, do things like adoptions. So we've worked with the Turtle Hospital in, in Florida, actually, um, and the Toucan Rescue Ranch in Costa Rica this year to help classes raise money for those causes and contribute to saving those animals through organizations that we can vouch for that are doing fantastic work. So for me, that's Planet Madagascar. I got to see their work firsthand. I got to see what they were doing in country, you know, planting trees, planting whole forests, working with the community to, to really build it up in, in an exciting way, talking with park staff, working to ensure conservation for decades to come. And so from Miami, you know, that sort of thing, that is something that you can do. You can make that happen. You can also share this with your, your teachers, your friends, your parents, et cetera. Like it's the best time to be a kid ever in terms of conservation. Seriously, everyone thought that it was going to be my generation, so I'm 27, that was going to change the world and be super into environment and do all these things. And it really, you know, we did okay, but we haven't done it. But it's your generation that is. Look at Greta going around the world, sponsoring movements and marches of millions of people to make take action on climate change. So kids have the power. So if you write people in your community, if you write legislators, you know, congressmen, senators, whatever the equivalent is, you know, uh, all across the world, if you tell your families about this, if you share these sort of stories uh, about Madagascar, what's happening to it, about conservation and what's happening to it, you can make the biggest difference. People are listening to you in a way that no one, like that's never happened in history. Um, so it's a really exciting time to be a kid interested in these sort of things. So right, share the message and, uh, and contribute how you can. I hope that answers it, but it's a, a start anyway. And then, yes, we'll wrap up. We'll go back to Texas. One last question from Miss Elliott's class. Sorry, and then, yes, we'll wrap up. We'll go back to Miss. Yeah, whoever wants. Okay. Bella, Bella, go ahead. What inspired you to get yeah, into this work and go to Madagascar? <laughs> Yeah, so this work, I mean, I thank you for that question. I love that question. When I was a kid, there was a guy on TV named the Crocodile Hunter. So Steve Irwin. And Steve Irwin was my hero. I had Steve Irwin themed birthday parties. I had his poster on my wall. I watched everything he ever did. He was fantastic. And he was this wildlife warrior who went around the world and learned about all these amazing places and shared them with me. And so as a four-year-old, I'm looking at this and thinking, man, this guy gets to go to the most amazing places, share how passionate and how much he loves these places. And people pay him to do this and people listen to him when he's talking about it. So from four years old, I'm one of those like lucky, lucky people that from four years old, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to share stories of science and exploration with the public in a big way to encourage them to take action and do something. And between exploring by the seat of your pants, some of the other work that I've done over the last years, I've had a chance to do that. And I am like, I pinch myself every day at how lucky I am uh, to have this opportunity. For Madagascar specifically, uh, through Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, one of the first people who ever did a talk for us was Travis Steffens. So Travis Steffens uh, works really closely with us. So he's the founder of Planet Madagascar. And a couple of years ago, he'd said, you know, if I get a chance to go on an expedition again, when I next do that, if you'd like to join, you're welcome to. So again, the offer for a, a person who, you know, I, I traveled a bit, but to go on an actual research expedition to Madagascar, which for me, 
was particularly exciting. My first big word I ever said in my life was Madagascar because it's so phonetic, Madagascar. So I was so excited at the chance to do that. I never thought I'd get a chance to see it. And so I had this opportunity to go and, and it's been, it was such a thrill, such a unique opportunity in my life. Um, and hopefully uh, this presentation continues the trend of, of getting to educate and share stories about such an amazing and unique place and encourage you guys to learn more and, and work to conserve it and protect it. Well, uh, again, usually I turn it over to classes and I say a big thank you to the speaker, but I'm the speaker. So I, I really appreciate all you guys being here today. It's been so nice getting a chance to talk about this, this time and, and time of my life and, and the expedition. And I hope you're inspired to learn more. I'm gonna share pictures of the II and some other cool stuff and Planet Madagascar website so you can learn more about them. Um, but for now, I just, I'll demute all your mics and I'll say a huge thank you and goodbye to all of you. So you're all demuted. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Awesome. All right, have a nice rest of your day, everyone. And check us out soon. So in addition to me, there's like a ton of people this January that are doing fantastic sessions. Another one today with Adam Schultz, who's one of the Canada's leading explorers. Watch that on YouTube uh, live. And then throughout the week, there's some incredible stories. I hope to see you back soon as a host. I hope to come back and, and talk about uh, this in a, in a bigger way uh, in the future as well. So thank you so much, guys.